Well, thank you everybody for coming and welcome to uh, a happy new year to all of you and welcome to the UW uh, Space Dialogues for uh, this year. It's my great pe pleasure to welcome Darren McKnight, uh, who is the Senior Technical Fellow for Leo Labs, one of the leading companies in the space debris uh, business. And Leo Labs is in particular interested in what it calls a mapping platform that is critical to space domain awareness. And it's only with SDA that we can really think about building safe and secure practices for civilian, commercial, and military stakeholders. Now, I know you probably all saw uh, Darren's very impressive background uh, that really pinpoints him uh, as one of the leading technical authorities in the realm of space debris. And I want to highlight just a few things that I think are very uh, relevant. He is a very active member of the International Academy of Astronautics Space Debris uh, Committee. He has also co-authored five books, including those on space debris and spacecraft and over a hundred technical uh, papers. His training is a bachelor's degree in engineering sciences from the US Air Force Academy, a master's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of New Mexico, and a PhD from the University of Colorado in aerospace engineering sciences. Now, Darren is coming to us as saying earlier to, um, to him on a very, on a particularly important day because just yesterday, the Space Force announced that it is focusing in orbital debris removal services from the private sector to a program called Orbital Prime, which is focusing on the growing problem of orbital debris uh, and SDA. So Darren, welcome uh, to our space dialogues at UW and the floor is yours. Super, thank you so much. Um, first question I need to ask is, can anybody see my chart I just put up? Yes. Super, all right. So um, first off, thank you very much. Um, University of Washington, Sadia, Amy, for, to, for letting me have this opportunity to speak to this August group. And as I see the people come on board, I'm a, I'm a little bit frightened by the, the firepower we have online here, but I will do my best to um, really, what I wanna do is sort of queue up um, some thoughts about Leo Labs, but really it's not about Leo Labs, it's about space safety. And um, this presentation is, is titled Leo Labs Capabilities Trajectory. I think what's important is um, space as an operational domain is changing rapidly and the systems and the capabilities to monitor, characterize and inform people of that have to move at the same pace or we're gonna fall behind. And so this is really just a talking a little about Leo Labs and where we're going, but really in the midst of all that, it's, it's what we're doing to make space safer. And many of you know, I haven't worked for Leo Labs for a long time. So as I like to say, I haven't got the whole lobotomy, the full lobotomy yet. I'm not thinking like a Leo Labs person, I'm thinking of like a space safety person. And the reason I came to Leo Labs, I think there's a capability brewing here that is very critical. So let's take a look at that, um, what that means. So the first thing about Leo Labs and the value proposition that we bring, is we are trying to deal with some of these space domain awareness challenges. And for the ones of you who aren't familiar with the term space domain awareness, a lot of people think about space situational awareness. That's sort of a commercial term, like this is what's going on in space. And you, buy, you throw domain in there and you're starting to talk a little bit like a military person, talk about monitoring and characterizing specific events you know, really what we're trying to do is know what's going on up there and make sure there's traceability between observables and people's actions so that we can try to improve people's behaviors in the future so we all can reliably use space for a very long time. So what specifically do we do at Leo Labs? So um, we're building a global network of radars to provide responsive space traffic management. So what that means is we provide information to operators, um, to tell them if there's a likely conjunction in their near future that they want to avoid. And unfortunately, those are happening more and more often. We provide the risk assessments of those actual events to say, what is the probability? What is the consequence of those things? And what many of you will, what many of you may not know is that when a satellite in low Earth orbit avoids a collision with a piece of space debris and they go, Phew, no problem with space debris anymore. No, you just avoided two to 3% of the mission terminating risk. There's over 95% of the mission terminating risk from debris that we don't currently catalog. The one to 10 centimeter size range, roughly, there's estimates from um, 500,000 and 900,000 objects in that size range. 
that right now we don't avoid. We just cross our fingers and hope we don't get hit by it. We will start to catalog those um, coming up early in 2022. Um, that we'll start to start to work our way down from the 10 centimeter threshold down, down, down to try and get um, custody and provide awareness about avoiding those collisions. As part of looking at all the um, all this data, we we provide patterns of life analysis. And this is very important for space domain awareness. How satellites are, are acting over time, when they are operating, and even when they're dead. When you see a rocket body being stable and all of a sudden starts to tumble, that information is important. It might tell you something that's relevant to you and the environment, how the environment is either degrading or how people are operating in space. We also do change of state. When looking at an individual object, I mentioned when it goes from stable to unstable or if it maneuvers. Well, sometimes maneuver is because um, somebody actually provided a propulsive um, impulse to the satellite, so it was on purpose. Sometimes it could be some environmental effect. Maybe it's a propellant tank that's leaking, and so you get something that looks like thrust. So there's lots of things that we have to try to monitor to help people understand what's going on. One thing that we've been doing a lot of is launch and early operations awareness. So when, when SpaceX launches 100 satellites at a time, it's actually very difficult to differentiate those objects as they are being deployed. So we provide that and we've uh, managed, I think, over the deployment of over 1,700 satellites in the last uh, year and a half to actually watch those and, and make sure we know which are which and move on. And the last thing that I want to talk about of problems that we're solving is statistical risk and hazard evaluation. And we'll show some plots on this. All the risk isn't about the single event. Just like in traffic, you worry about, you get that stop sign, somebody ran the red light and you go, oh, that was a near miss. But really you have to take a bigger picture and go, what are all the possible ways in which there are accidents and, and problems happening if you're looking at, at, at terrestrial traffic, you know, people driving cars, we do the same thing when we're looking at space. So the most important thing for you to understand is how we are improving is changing very quickly. So let's take a look real quick if you're not familiar with, with Leo Labs. Right now we have six radars at four locations around the world, including the Southern Hemisphere, which is real important because when you're looking at events and being able to characterize them the sooner, the more recently you saw an object before the event, the more likely you have a good characterization of it. So many of like the 18th Space Control Squadron has all the radars in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, some things down the Southern Hemisphere, it takes a while for either the debris cloud or a maneuver to be detected when it's down in the Southern Hemisphere. So we're trying to be very geographically dispersed. We have a, a recent um, opening of radar in Costa Rica. We have a couple down in um, New Zealand. On those two sites, Costa Rica and New Zealand, at a single site, we have two radars. Um, and that's very important for the way in which we can get lots of measurements and lots of updates very, very quickly. We have two older radars at Midland, um, Texas, in Poker Flats, um, Alaska. And those, um, those make our global network for right now. However, if you see this map here, we actually are planning on adding 10 more radars at five more sites, hopefully by the end of 2022, um, we're no different than anybody else. The supply chain issues um, are affecting us as, as much as anybody. Um, and so we're probably not going to get all um, 10 radars in in 2022 as planned. Um, if you look at this map, what we have announced so far is Azores. We've already broken ground in the Azores. Um, we've also broken ground in Perth, Australia. Um, we're moving to get the site in Argentina. Um, these other sites, one in Africa, one out here in the middle of the Pacific, um, we've not officially announced yet, but um, if we want to stay geographically dis diverse, you can imagine those would be good places for us to fill in the gaps um, overall. Um, we are an operational company. We were a startup company back in 2016, and people are like, what in the heck do you think you're doing? And we're supporting SpaceX, NOAA, Maxar, um, a variety of other customers. Many of them don't, we can't mention um, they don't want us to mention their names, but, but we provide coverage for a, a very large. And one thing we can say for sure is we manage um, the collision avoidance services support for over half of the operational satellites in low Earth orbit. That's easy to say when you're supporting SpaceX and Starlink, right? Um, but indeed, that's the case. So what's kind of the, the, the battle rhythm of, of our system? So this system metrics page is sort of tells you everything that we do. 
And so what's really important on this chart, what's really important on this page is the fact that we have a latency of six minutes. What does that mean? That means that any time an object crosses any of our radars around the world, within six minutes, we have gotten that information, we've collected the information for any object, we've updated the state vectors, and, um, uh, and made those available to our customers within six minutes. Um, normally right now, when you're looking at those kinds of updates with the current, um, many of the current systems, you're talking about usually an eight hour sort of op tempo at best. So for us to do it in six minutes is very important for us to respond to this growing um, um, scale. One of the things that we provide that lower right hand corner is CDMs, conjunction data messages. So 30 seconds after we know where everything is, we tell people for all these conjunctions that we're worried about, here's, um, here's exactly which objects are in play. As a quick, as a quick digression, um, I monitor this every single day. Like I said, taking the heartbeat of low Earth orbit. That's what we do. We take the heartbeat of low Earth orbit. Where are, where are the pain points, right? Where is the patient sore? And um, two days ago, I looked that we have five events, five potential conjunctions over the next five days where the missed distance will be less than 100 meters and the probability of collision greater than one in a thousand. One in a thousand may not seem like a very large number to y'all, but when it comes to space collision events, one in a thousand is what the probability was before Iridium and Cosmos collided, okay? One times 10 to minus six, people say, I'm gonna think about maneuvering and I'm definitely gonna maneuver if it's 10 to the minus four. So we're talking five events within five days. And so we're monitoring those very closely. Um, we have an ability to rapidly determine if there was a collision, two of those events passed, um, with, with no no issues, three more are coming up. Um, and so how do we get that information? We get that information, we take over half a million uh, measurements a day. Um, that's comparable to the 18 Space Control Squadron that provides the same kind of global network support as, as we do. Um, and we make about 11, uh, generate about 11 million conjunction data messages a day. So what, what's important there is if there's a conjunction coming up in six days, We'll update it every time an object crosses the radar. So we get to see trends. We start to see how things are getting closer, converging onto a number or maybe diverging away. And so just like if you want to know what the traffic is, I live in Northern Virginia. If you want to know what the traffic is, taking a look at the traffic cameras at midnight and at noon doesn't do any good for you, right? You need to have a, a pretty good op tempo of taking pictures. And so we know that's the same case here to look at how things can maneuver and how things change over time. So all that sort of tells you how we rapidly do things. It showed some quick pictures about conjunction assessments, but I think what's really, really important is what are the value added insights that all this data gives you? Having this global network of radars, cloud-based computational engine where we can get that information out to our users within six minutes, that's great. But what, is it, what does it tell you? And so what this really does, it really provides us this really rich database um, that allows us, as, as Sadia said, to map out low Earth orbit. So um, many of the folks on the, on, on the listening right now know that oftentimes I'll, I'll jokingly say I'm a space detective, right? I'm out there to help. Well, I'm a space realtor now too, right? Location, location, location. It matters where you are. And I'm gonna show you how these 11 million conjunction data messages today help us understand what's going on in low Earth orbit to help us be more aware of what we should be doing, what kind of behaviors we should be encouraging. And when something bad does go wrong, we have a better understanding about what happened. Um, this plot is a very busy plot, I apologize. It's a plot that only an engineer can love. Um, but what this plot is, is it's looking at 800,000 conjunctions. When I mentioned that we do 11 million CDMs a day, it may be 30 CDMs on a single event, right? It's a trending it down. So this 800,000 um, conjunctions were, was actually um, uh, many tens of millions of CDMs, but there's 800,000 events over a year's time frame. And what we did is we looked at only the events that had a probability of collision of over 10 to the minus six. And what we did is we represented a dot for each probability of collision and each consequence, right? For the ones of you who love risk, I make everything into a risk equation, right? Risk is probability times consequence. 
And so if we look at a probability of an event and a consequence of the event, and the consequence I'm measuring here is, is the debris generating potential. So the amount of mass involved. The amount of mass involved will be directly proportional to how much debris, lethal debris that might be created. So this is 800,000 um, tick marks over a year's time. And what I did is these lines that are diagonal, these are risk contour lines. So everything in risk region one is the greatest risk. Probability times consequence. You'll notice in that there's only one little orange dot. Um, uh, by the way, um, Amy and Sadia told me it's very important to make sure we get through the charts first and then we can have discussions that I love. I have like nine charts related to this one chart that we could go on for an hour. We won't. So I'm, I'm going through it kind of quickly, but I want you to get a sampling of the kind of insight that we're providing. So each of these dots is an individual event, right? And so in this next band, and this, as you notice, the numbers along the side, like the first one, there's one event in there. And then the next band, there's like 208 events in there. So the top 200 objects, top 200 events over that whole year's time frame has these orange and blue dots. So what's the orange and blue? So many people are worried about space traffic management. We need to make sure that operational satellites don't collide with other operational satellites or get hit by debris. That's very important, right? It's very important. And many people go, it is the number one thing by far. And what I'm showing you here is all the blue dots are space traffic management. So you see a blue dot, that means an operational payload with one of the two objects that we looked at here. If it's an orange dot, that means it's debris on debris. That means it's either a dead payload, an abandoned rocket body, or a piece of fragmentation debris large enough to track. And it's just those two things hitting each other, which people kind of had a tendency to go, eh, I can't control this, so I'm not gonna worry about it. But in reality, in reality, Two thirds of the debris generating potential in low Earth orbit does not come from space traffic management. It comes from space debris management. It comes from preventing big dead things hitting other big dead things. And oh, by the way, even a piece of debris from a fragmentation event hitting a rocket body can still cause a catastrophic event. It's worse if it's two rocket bodies, it's worse if it's two dead payloads, but any one of these orange dots as a measure of the mass, is that consequence can, can provide um, a significant degradation to the collision, um, uh, your, your reliability in low Earth orbit. And so what a lot of people I like to say is you hear all about space traffic management, and I love the fact that, that Space Force said, yes, we're concerned about go picking up debris. I will tell you, the U.S. is woefully behind the rest of the world in this area. It's embarrassing to me hearing people talk about the need for ADR and the need for uh, um, um, debris remediation as if it's something that's gonna be decades out. Um, the uh, French Space Agency, European Space Agency, and Japan are way ahead on these sort of things. And so I'm very happy to see um, some folks in the US starting to say, we need to be putting some money and operationalizing these things like Clear Space and Astroscale are doing. Um, we don't have any very many of those companies in the U.S. doing things right now because it's been sort of seen as something we can worry about decades later. We need to worry about it now. This plot is my realtor, my space realtor plot. Okay, so if I'm taking you out to show you condos in space, this is where I'm telling you where the bad neighborhoods are. And so again, the blue line represents space traffic management aggregate risk. So now I took the probability and the and the consequence and multiplied it together. And then I added them all up for each altitude. So before I didn't show you altitude, right? So again, I could have had 10 charts in here to kind of help, help the storyline along here, but I'm rushing so we can get to, to, to some great conversations at the end. So the blue line is where the aggregate risk comes more from space traffic management. And by the way, I have to tell you, we have to be careful about that because that space, that's the risk based upon radar observations. The operational satellite, their ephemeris, if they have GPS, um, some type of ephemeris on board, they will know where they are better than we can tell you, right? So we understand that. Ground-based radar is looking up an operational satellite. We can help you worrying about the dead piece of debris, but you know where you are better than we do because of the GPS ephemeris. So this, the blue line, you have to be very careful on, it may be exaggerated because it does not include the operational ephemeris that comes from our radar measurements. 
and the fact that their risk, they can mitigate their risk by doing a collision avoidance maneuver, of course, right? And the, all the orange stuff isn't. So what this shows you, there's a peak, there's a bad neighborhood here. Don't buy condos in the 780 to 850 kilometer range. This is a hotbed. This is an area that is really sort of a, a, a concern going forward. And, and the reason why it's a concern going forward, by the way, is a combination of debris from a Chinese ASAT event, um, of rocket bodies that were abandoned by the Russians um, decades ago, and derelict US payloads and debris from those derelict US payloads where we had a lot of battery ruptures of those. So unfortunately, and if you want to quote for today's talk that you can laugh about around the water cooler, it's a uniquely ironic collaborative effort by the three major spacefaring countries to muck up this altitude um, significantly. So this region is really, you know, a lot of a lot of people want to sort of say, oh, it's the Russians' fault, it's the Chinese fault, it's the Americans' fault. Unfortunately, we we've had we've had a we've done a great job of of cooperating on messing up this very important part of low Earth orbit between all three of the major spacefaring agencies. And you wouldn't understand that until you, you did this heartbeat of low Earth orbit and looked at all the different combinations and which ones were responsible. I will tell you that there's this, there's this peak around 1400 kilometers that's really scary. Why is that scary, right? It's not as big as 850. The problem is if, if you're aware of astrodynamics and atmospheric drag effects, things that happen four, five, 600 kilometer altitude, you get a little bit of cleansing from atmospheric drag, right? It may take five, 10, 20 years for debris that's, that's down in the four or 500 kilometer range, a lot of it to be washed out. At 1400 kilometers, it's there for good. It's there for centuries. So we've had a number of events at 1400 kilometers that are really scary. Um, there are five events, like I mentioned earlier, that we're looking at for this next week that were pretty high risk. One of them was at 1,400 kilometers, two, two derelict Russian payloads, um, less than 100 um, meter missed distance, probability of collision, four times 10 to the minus three, really bad. And those things, unfortunately, like, like every kind of mathematics, um, if you get a bunch of close, um, a, a very close misses, pretty soon you're going to have that collision that's going to be a significant problem. So, so when we talk about all the stuff that Leo Labs does, what we really want to do is we want to sort of talk about what are the right questions um, to ask and then what are the right answers. So I want to try and just talk about some high level things that I touched on a little bit during the course of this presentation. Constellations, are they the problem or a victim, right? Many people are, are going out and talking publicly, oh, Starlink and OneWeb, they're, 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 making, they're making low Earth orbit not safe. It's not true. They really are the victim. These, many of these satellite operators are working with mitigation guidelines and operational procedures that are much more stringent than any government guideline that's being asked of people to follow. They're being safer than what the government's asking them to do, but they are going to likely have some difficult um, times in the near future because of this built up, pent up debris generating potential from many objects in, in um, overlapping, like at 850 with dead payloads, dead rocket bodies, debris from purposeful um, um, A side events, that combination, nothing to do with the one webs and the space Texas and the iridiums of the world who are operating very, very, very responsibly. Secondly, why is the debris growing so quickly? Is it a technology shortfall? Is a lack of awareness of how things are made, or is it really a failure of inconvenience? And, and I'll tell you, I think very clearly it's a failure of inconvenience. Um, one thing that has really bothered me is um, looking at debris mitigation guidelines in this 25-year rule. So many of you may, may or may not know the 25-year rule, but basically 25-year rule is sort of a, a guideline, except in France, thank you, Christophe um, from Cadets, except in France where it is a law, but every place else it's a guideline. 25 years after your satellite stopped operating, you should remove it from orbit. It should be out of orbit within 25 years. That was established back in 1997, put into play about 2002, based upon technology and environmental populations at that time. Both of those have changed drastically. I've done a couple of papers looking at the fact that the constraints that they wanted to adhere to, the, the thresholds of, of engineering restrictions on 
on construction of satellites in 1997, if you updated that with new kinds of propulsion systems, we could adhere to a one-year rule or a five-year rule, which means getting things out much more quickly, but yet we don't have anybody who's actually changed the guidelines to do that. So, so I think that's really important to understand that debris growth is like almost everything that ends up being a big disaster. Nobody gets an award for preventing a disaster that never occurred, but we all feel so good when we his, when we heroically respond to a disaster. I hope that's not going to be the case, but that's a concern that I have. The last thing, which is a little self-serving because I'm representing LEO Labs, that's a single capability with most improved space safety in LEO. Clearly, if we can get more of these centimeter-sized debris that are lethal but non-trackable, right now the catalog of operational satellites and, and, and debris in low Earth orbit is over 18,000 objects, um, and some estimates a little bit higher. And there's, and there's going to be probably at least 500,000 lethal non-trackable on top of that 18,000 cataloged objects, clearly if we can start to take some of that um, lethal non-trackable risk and turn it into risk that we can manage, then life will be better. So that's what we're trying to do at, at LEO Labs. So that was my attempt to sort of give a quick introduction on a lot of technical stuff at once. And I'm sure many of you go, show me chart five and let's talk about a half an hour on it. But I want to give you a sampling, um, sort of a smorgasbord here and uh, open it up for questions. Darren, thank you so much. That was a fantastic overview of uh, the challenges that we're facing and the ways that you're thinking about uh, solutions. So we have a number of uh, questions um, already. Let me begin with just a, a general one. I think a lot of these are sort of more on the STEM side, and these are people who probably want to talk about the charts for hours on end. Just to open it up a little bit, um, you uh, talked about in your um, uh, about the importance of behavior as well, not just uh, technical solutions. Can you say a little bit more about what you mean when you say you want to have an impact on global behavior? Because one of the things that I'm doing research on and that is very clear is that all the data in the world <laughs> doesn't make a difference if the uh, it, there's no impact on persuading people. So how do we sort of build that out into the platforms uh, that you're building technically? Yeah, so, so one of the things, obviously, it, it, not obviously, but a lot of people talk about we're going to be safer if we're transparent. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm right outside of Washington, D.C. That transparency is a, is a real Washington word. I don't like it, right? <laughs> what we need is we need three different T's. We need truth, trust, and traceability. Mm -hmm. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a system of data that with truth, we're going to show you our work. We're going to show exactly what our radars are measuring, exactly how they were, we're measuring them. We're going to show you the, how we propagated the orbits, and we're going to show you all the work that goes into getting that risk calculation so that then you can examine that. We're also going to build up trust by sharing information on non-critical events because you need to get a, a good feeling that, hey, I, I can use that information in a positive way. The last thing we're going to do is traceability. We want to be able to say, we are measuring this for a specific reason. We're not measuring it to be onerous and overwatching. We're, we're measuring it because it helps us understand. So a very political um, thing that has gone on recently, I'm going to make a statement. I do not represent the U.S. government, but I will tell you that China's claim that Starlink put them at risk um, was really kind of a, a, a silly statement to make when you look at the whole picture, right? Because um, SpaceX provides their operational ephemeris on a public platform for anybody to go get to look at where they where they're going to be in the near future. Um, the Chinese space station had actually coordinated with the 18th, which is something they're allowed to do. They're welcome to do. They would have that information, and that and then these conjunctions that somehow appeared to them to be very risky. Um, would not have been, they would have had more information. If we start building that kind of relationship, um, SpaceX does this with the ISS routinely, and they can do the exact same thing with CSS. And so that's where I think people's behavior was, well, they, they put me at risk, but in reality, you didn't share the information or ask for the information, even get access to what's provided free on a public site 
So it's kind of not, it doesn't, that, that the, the, the statement doesn't really reinforce the behaviors that could have easily reduced the risk for that space asset. And oh, by the way, if you take a look at the amount of collision avoidance maneuvers that SpaceX and other folks have had to do from Fing Young debris from the Chinese ASAT event, um, of the 800,000 um, conjunctions that occurred in, in that last year time frame, that was above 10 and minus six, 25% of those were with a Fing Young piece of debris. 25%. So, you know, it's a little disingenuous if you look at two events and that you could have gotten the information made available. And so that's the behavior I'm talking about. You have to start by sharing information, making it available, and actually talking ab about it and doing something about it. Thank you so much, Darren. I think you raise a good point. We have to think very hard about preemptively uh, sort of informing people if you're going to have an impact um, on a behavior. I have so many questions, so I'm going to get uh, right to them. This first question is from uh, Oksana Elkmari. She's at PNNL. Uh, Darren, do you rely on the information from your radars only, or do you cross-check with data coming out from other companies and or governments? Yeah, we absolutely cross-check with the 18 Space Control Squadron. We work very closely with them. Um, as we like to say, when we get a new customer on board and they go, oh, you don't have to use the 18th? No, you want to use the 18th. Just like when we see a hurricane coming in and they show the European model and the U.S. model of here's how the hurricane's tracking, you want to do both. Sometimes, you know, and, and so um, that's what we work with. As far as other companies, there are no other companies that really provide robust amount of, of low Earth orbit uh, measurements, right? Because because telescopes give you some really good characterization, but it's hard to get the bandwidth of 18,000 objects updating multiple times a day um, with telescopes because of the lighting conditions in low Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely work very closely with the 18 Space Control Squadron and, and, and their network of, of radar supporting low Earth orbit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So thank you. The next question is um, for the LEO collision risk continuum chart, the mm -hmm. data, are from a time period that already passed. So how Absolutely. many of these collisions actually occurred? How much debris was actually generated? Yeah, 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 great question. Um, from those events, there were no accidental collisions from all of those conjunctions. Um, and this is actually uh, something I'm doing a paper on um, coming up for a conference in April in Madrid is about how do we take this um, statistical risk and deterministic risk and, and, and have them converge. So CDMs are conjunctions that are misses, right? So this is this object and this object came this close. So what does that mean? It means that if you add all up all the risk, it might tell you what risk that, that a single object that had multiple events um, had, had been exposed to. However, we have models to do that without looking at any empirical data. If I look at the number of objects per cubic kilometer of spatial density and look at their relative velocity and their sizes, I can come up with a, you have a one in a thousand chance over a year's time to have a collision. These other events that are 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus five, do those add up to look at the statistical risk, right? So we are doing that right now. All those dots, none of those dots on there was it, did an actual collision take place? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are close approaches. But when you look at the models, and I have, those are some of the charts I could have shown, right? Where you look at statistical risk, you show all of them coming up in time. And what you see is the ones that are like kilometer misses, they happen pretty often. The ones that are 500 meters to a kilometer don't happen as often. The one down here, 10 meter to 100 meter, ooh. Boy, the, and so you start to see a mathematical trend, a statistical trend of when you can anticipate that first event occurring. And that's what we're trying to model before they occur. We're trying to model where is that likely going to be. So we help people like Chuck Dickey's on the line here, help him say, which objects do you need to go get first, right? Um, and so that's why we're trying to build those models and bring both the empirical and analytic models together. Fantastic. Next question. Is there a temporal chart one can imagine that shows when collision potential reaches a catastrophic asymptote? as a function of altitude? So um, I don't know what you mean by, by catastrophic uh, event. A single event's pretty catastrophic. I think may, maybe what they're talking about is when we're gonna have like a, a Kessler syndrome or sort of runaway sort of event 
right? And 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 of course, those are those models. The interesting thing about those those time scales on those are are thousands of years for it to be a quote runaway event. To me, here's when it's catastrophic: a single event that causes the probability of collision to rise to the point that satellites cannot work through their operational lifetime reliably. And we are close to that in some orbits right now because of the lethal non-trackable debris. Things like the Cosmos 1408 event with the Russian ASAT event that just occurred, it raised the probability of collision within a significant portion of low Earth orbit by on average a factor of two. Hmm. Well, you get too many factors of two and you get to the point where these satellites that we've gotten really spoiled about being able to operate build it for 10 years and it'll last for 15. We build it for four years and we fly it for eight. We're gonna to get to the point where that's not gonna be the case. And so I know it's not as dramatic as a runaway effect, but that's when it's gonna to start to hit the bottom line. That's when a satellite that was supposed to be removed at the end of operational life won't be able to be removed because it got hit by a piece of debris, it got disabled and now it becomes part of the debris. So to me, the catastrophic part is when we start to have um, not meeting the operational lifetime of satellites on orbit. And, and I think in some altitudes, we're getting close to that, largely because of lethal non-trackable debris. So like Cosmos 1408, we know there's probably 500 to 2,000 objects that will end up being tracked. Um, there's likely 10 times more lethal non-trackable, mm -hmm. right? And so we are monitoring very carefully satellites in that region that might have anomalistic events that would be indicative of being hit by a small piece of debris, not enough to be knocked out, maybe enough to spin it on, on its axis, lose some power of its solar array. So we have to be, we'd be watching for those kinds of events to be indicative of, of the indicators that we're getting to that point. And so, so, I, so I think that to me is catastrophic. We work about a runaway thing, then we're talking about things on a a time scale of thousands of years, and then people get bored and go, oh, I don't care. So I think catastrophic is when it starts to affect the bottom line and people have to change where they put satellites. Mm -hmm. And we're not far from that. Mm. Very interesting. Um, uh, so you raised the international context. Um, so there are two questions back to back that uh, people have posed. One is, what are some space debris programs in Europe and Japan that you think are actually making changes? Well, I think, uh, yes, yeah, so what I was talking about there was um, um, JAXA being supportive and Japan being supportive of Astroscale as an active debris removal um, company, and they're doing more than just active debris removal now. Same thing with European Space Agency funding ClearSpace to actually go out and go get an actual object as a piece of debris and, and bringing it down. So those agencies, along with those companies, are sort of leading the way. Uh, into that. There are a lot of other remediation options. Um, uh, uh, Christoph, who's on the line here, we both are working on something called just-in-time collision avoidance. There's a lot of times remediation of a derelict object doesn't come from removing it. It comes from making sure it doesn't collide. Because other than the issues of light pollution, as long as it doesn't collide with something up there, then it's not really a hazard, right? Now, that won't, that won't scale long-term, but for some of these objects, um, at 850 kilometer altitude, there are these there are these rocket bodies. 18 of these rocket bodies that are 9,000 kilograms. They're a big yellow school bus without brakes and without a driver. Mm -hmm. 9,000 kilograms. There is not a single ADR company right now that is planning to bring down a 9,000 kilogram object. So what do we do? Well, maybe we see a potential event that's going to occur and we nudge it out of the way. So again, that's where Kness, French Space Agency, has worked hard on on looking toward advancing along those lines. So I think there's a lot of different um, um, pockets of that going on. Unfortunately, many of the pockets uh, occur in Europe and Japan and haven't, haven't been as active in the US, I, I, I'm sad to say. Um, uh, again, on the international, could you speak a little bit more about Leo Lab's work with the New Zealand government to track all Ooh. objects launched from New Zealand territory? What a great question. Is there, who's the ringer asked that one? Um, uh, it's Victoria, actually. Victoria. Oh, Victoria. Oh, yeah. yeah, Victoria, thank you. Yeah, so we support the New Zealand Space Agency um, for regulatory compliance. So well, isn't that a shocking idea that a, con a country actually wants to make sure that anything launched from their soil is compliant with mitigation guidelines? What a shocker. So we actually... Uh, and a matter of fact, we're just they're doing a rework with them right now about looking at, I call it compliance as a continuum. 
right? There's many things that are in this compliance. Um, if you look at if you look at uh, um, debris mitigation guidelines, there's, there's probably 10 things. 25 year rule pops out, but there's many things that are in there about about limiting the probability of collision with trackable, uh, limiting the probability of no, with lethal non-trackable, about about limiting the probability of explosions and how you look at measuring and assessing and providing that information. So we actually have a, an active dashboard on our platform for New Zealand to go, how are we doing? We let an object launch from our soil. We have a responsibility to, to monitor and characterize how well we are complying with regulatory stuff. Unfortunately, the standard kind of thing around the world is, here's all the paperwork to get licensed to prove that I followed all these guidelines. You launch, you're done. There's not a penalty if you don't meet it. There's not a penalty if you don't do what you said you were going to do. It's just sort of all up front. And, and I think I, I, I applaud New Zealand for taking the initiative to say they are responsible, they want to monitor, they want to characterize, and they want to inform future launches on people who aren't satisfying guidelines. So that's a, it's a really great shining example. And we're very happy to support them in, in that vision. A great duty of care kind of um, example as well. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Environment. So I think that that is really uh, fabulous. Let me uh, quickly, could you comment on the relations you have with 18th and with EU SST? Yeah, so, so um, with the 18th, if we actually take everything that the 18th produces and we actually make available to our customers both what the 18th would provide as far as CDMs are concerned, and what we provide. And we actually have a dashboard where you can pick and choose which one does which. So you can kind of compare and contrast and figure out things. So it's sometimes if there's an event, like I said, in the Southern Hemisphere, we see the objects much more often, much, much closer to the events that we might have better custody than maybe the 18th. Does. There might be other ones that, um, that they have seen and, and, and can provide a different information is we provide all that. So, so we take stuff from them all the time. During Fort Cosmos 1408, we had discussions with them about, here's what we've seen. As I mentioned, um, maybe I mentioned this before we started this talk, but within 24 hours, we had a Gabbard diagram, which is Gabbard diagram, kind of like a, 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 a scatter plot of the debris from the event. We put that, we were the first ones to put out a Gabbard diagram because we don't have the same sort of um, restrictions and things and concerns that you worry about. Um, and so we were able to do that, but we, we try to cross talk between all the time, our, our commercial customers. Uh, we don't try to, you know, we, we make sure we say, this is, this is theirs, this is ours, look at it together. And it helps you get more confidence and feel better about things in the future. Sometimes since we turn our, our data around every seven, seven minutes after something goes over one of our radar sites, we might give a cue sooner than the 18th might. But the 18th might be able to put more assets on something for a long period of time. And so it's a, it's a combination. Um, so we work very closely from a data perspective. We don't have a lot of phone calls back and forth because we know how, how, we, how we operate. Um, and EUSST? Oh, EUSST. Um, honestly, right now, EUSST, um, we haven't had a lot of um, uh, interaction um, with the EUSST. We've had a lot of good interactions with ESA, uh, CNES, Italian Space Agency, UK Space Agency, but not with EUSST. Um, and I see Christoph doing this. I don't know how you say that in French, put your hands up, but I don't know, je ne sais quoi. Um, and, and, uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I don't, I have no comment. I, I, I answered your question and you can infer from that what you would like. Can you talk about, this is from Teresa Hitchens, you probably also know. I know um, Teresa. Uh, yeah. So can you talk about the barriers to using the propulsion methods that would allow a five or one year rule for deorbit? So are yeah. they yeah. expensive? And have you or Leo Labs commented on the OSTP study that we discussed, I think, on January uh, 13th? Teresa, I have commented <laughs> on that plan. And, and um, I, I, I was asked to help on the plan that was being developed. I made comments at that time. I made the same comments after I saw the final plan. Um, so, um, and those comments are, are part of public record. 
And I do not believe that, um, yeah, I, I, I don't believe that that was, um, to me, a best effort. I don't think it showed traceability between highest, in highest, um, most important problems and how they're going to invest money to hit the most important problems. It seemed like we're just going to, we're just going to define things in such a way that we can, we can let everybody who's doing work continue to do work. So I'm, I was not, I, I did, was not very um, impressed with that final product. Um, but that's all public record, so you can, somebody can go look. What was the, what was the first part of the question again, Sadia? Yeah, I'm sorry, I got, I got hung up on the OS, on the, on the NTSC um, research plan because that really bugged me because they asked my opinion, I gave my opinion, then they wrote something completely different, and then asked my opinion again. So I just same, same opinion again. So you're now on the record, uh, Darren. I think that that is. Well, I'm in the, I'm on the record very clearly. They, if anybody read my comments, they're not part of the public record. It's no, there's no. I'm, I wasn't mixed, mincing words at all. Uh, sorry, let me just repeat the first question. Can you talk about the barriers to using the propulsion methods that would allow a five or one year rule for deorbit? Absolutely, yeah, that's a great question, Teresa. So um, I did a, an actual paper with actual rocket scientists, the guys from Aerojet Rocketdyne. And, and what we saw was using electric thrust systems that have really become very reliable now and, and the, co the price point's going down. Um, that's what it would allow us to go to one year and five year rules. So there's a paper that I did for the European Conference on Space Debris. I, I can send it to you, Sadia, so that you can send it to anybody, who's, or Teresa, I'll send it to Teresa so she asked the question. But we laid it all out. Obviously it would be a little bit more expensive. And, and from a 2007 paper that I wrote, pay me now or pay me more later. You know, so again, we get this continual thing of, oh, I don't know if I can pay for that. Well, I don't know if I can pay for you not doing it, right? I don't know if I can pay for, for, for folks like Kuiper, who's getting ready to launch, um, Telesat, SpaceX, Iridium, to continue to have to avoid satellites that, that are non-maneuverable, right? And act like it's their fault um, doing it. And so it is more expensive um, um, to, to, to have an electric thruster rather than a chemical propulsion system, no doubt about it. So that's an issue. Usually it takes up less volume. Hmm. Um, takes less mass, definitely less less fuel mass. And so I believe that um, uh, that, that that's important. Christoph just mentioned that if you use electric thruster, um, it may be an uncontrolled re-entry. Um, obviously an uncontrolled re-entry is, is unacceptable if, if your um, satellite's gonna survive to the ground. If your satellite's not gonna survive, any mass is gonna survive to the ground then then my, uh, my assessment would be an uncontrolled reentry uh, doesn't cross that other threshold of the one in 10, one in 10,000 probability of a casualty on the ground from reentry. If none of your mass makes it to the ground, then electric thruster would be acceptable, I believe. I, I'll talk with Christoph offline because he did just mention that. But if you don't survive to the ground, uncontrolled reentry is, is just fine, my understanding. Uh, hmm. Christoph is probably a better person, though. To, so I'll take a look at what he said in the chat side there. Um, here's a question. This is from Stan. You uh, met earlier. Um, if a small satellite operator is not a customer of Leo Labs or another paid SSA service provider, mm -hmm. who would appraise this satellite? Uh, who would apprise, excuse me, the satellite operators of a potential conjunction event, and how would that communication occur? Sure. So, so the 18 Space Control Squadron, um, they have a commercial space cell where any commercial operator can go in there and go. I have an operational satellite. This is how they contact me. Here's my email. Send me a CDM if my satellite gets close, and they will get it. Mm -hmm. They'll get it. Is there any? Sorry, Darren. Is there anything that um, that requires them to do that, or is it possible for someone to launch a small CubeSat and and never register and and not know if they were? It may, maybe it's maneuverable. Say it's a slightly larger CubeSat, and they they wouldn't know if somehow. Or does everyone automatically register and become part of that just because they're in the space business and they know know what to do? Um, that's a good question, Stan. I, I actually, I don't, I don't know what the percentage of people are. I don't think it's a requirement at all. It's okay. a service okay. that's being provided by the 18th, and it's a great service. Yeah. Um, obviously, it costs less than our service, um, but but it because it costs nothing. Um, but again, the tempor the temporal thing, and the and, and and actually, it's a really good question, Stan. If it's not required and it's not 100, percent then that means there are people who are operating things, getting their six months worth of of data. On a CubeSat, and and a lot of people have said before, Darren, your 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 five year rule and have to have closure voids isn't fair. 
because mm -hmm. CubeSat should be able to be launched. Fine, launch them all from the space station. Fine, launch everything that's unmaneuverable from the space station. That's a one year rule. It's a small satellite, one year. Perfect. If you want to go above it, put on propulsion, put on a propulsion system that allows it to avoid collisions while it's operating. Mm -hmm. You should be responsible. You're not going to send your kid out to the street with a bicycle that one can't turn, right? You, you need to have some control uh, and some responsibility. So I think those things are, are tough to get in. And back to Victoria's question, what are the, the resistance to implementation? Sometimes it's cost, sometimes it's this perception of of, of eliminating the opportunity for R&D. Well, I can do a lot of R&D from the space station with a CubeSat you toss out the side of the space station, right? Uh, I can do a lot. Why does, it, why does it have to be at 600 kilometers and then, be, and then have no collision avoidance capability? It works for six months and then it takes 15 years to come down. And that's compliant. I, I don't get it. That's my personal opinion. But I'm like, like Victoria brings up, there are costs to these things. I just believe that you know, pay me now, pay me now or pay me more later. Because when these issues start to mount, then the responsible player is going to end up spending more. And the ones who aren't responsible continue to do the minimum and they add up. Mm -hmm. They add up. Yeah. Stan, thanks for the question. Yeah, great, great question. Um, uh, another question, uh, sort of taking you into the realm of um, great power competition that we were <laughs> about earlier. How would you characterize the risk associated with ASAT and counter space weapons? There are no mechanisms preventing the development of ASAT counter space weapons, and the recent Russian ASAT test demonstrated how these capabilities will continue to proliferate. And this is my PhD student, Frank Kuzminski, who's doing a PhD on space security. So, 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 so here's a great thing I'm gonna tell Frank, and, and that is, um, I, you know, and, and by now you've already learned, I like one-liners because one-liners help people remember. It's like, a, like a, a Chinese parable or a Buddhist parable. The only generalization that's true is that no generalizations are true. So I can't answer that question. Are ASATs bad? ASATs are bad when you do them on a 2,000 kilogram satellite at, at, at 470 kilometers, right? It's bad. If you do it at 200 kilometers on a re-entry trajectory where the debris is around for 30 days, it's not as bad, right? If you do it at 850 kilometers, like the Chinese did, it's really, really bad. So in most situations, it's bad, but it can be less bad at lower altitudes, less persistence, and, um, you know, that's really what it comes down to. So I don't, I don't think that you could say there's an absolute that it's bad or, or, or good. Um, I think you have to look at the, uh, the risk that's imposed on rest of the responsible space operators relative to what you got out of that, got out of that. And it's irresponsible for the, for the Russians to to have knocked that 2,000 kilogram satellite at, at that high of an altitude and acted like it wasn't going to affect anybody else, right? Um, the Indians, when they did theirs, when India did theirs, um, while I wish they hadn't done it, it was orders of magnitude more responsible than, than what the Chinese and the Russians have done. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and the ASAT events, recent ones that the, that the US did, uh, again, were very responsible. Um, you know, I think any ASAT test has a, has a, probably is not good, but there's a wide range of goodness to badness and probably Chinese worse, Russian next. And then after that, everybody hadn't been so bad. So, so just to bring this back, and I think this ties to a question um, that is also asked, do, uh, does your answer or do you think that there's a possibility of coordinating data? And so uh, sort of, uh, informing people, Russians, other non-US tracking systems. You're already doing it with New Zealand. Is it realistic in the world in which we're in to think about uh, doing it also with peer competitors, for example? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think absolutely. It goes back to my three T's, right? Truth, trust, and traceability, right? We shouldn't be asking for information from another country that doesn't have traceability to how it benefits us to know that, right? So I think there's still a lot of tr lack of trust um, in many of the government to government interactions because like, why do you want to know that, right? Why, why do you want to know that? So I, I think that there is, but we have to be able to go, I need to know the size of your satellite because it, it provides a cross-section for me to use in my probability collision calculations. If you give me a wrong number, 
that size has a squared effect on the probability of collision. Therefore, if you give me something that's off by a factor of two, I'll be off by a factor of four for the answer. Oh, okay, now I understand. So I think oftentimes there's this high level discussion and we're not allowed to have what I call, and, and you know, people have used this word before, you know, track two diplomacy, have that sort of interaction. So I would love to see what's gonna end up happening between how the Chinese, um, I'm sure there, I'm sure the discussion's going on, I'm not privy to it. I'm close to Washington DC, but not in DC. I'm sure there's a lot of conversations going on between the US government and the Chinese government. I don't know how they're gonna end up doing that, but but you know, SpaceX or a, or a, or a Leo Labs, commercial companies, more than happy to be able to put the information on its common site and share it because we'd make sure that it would be the only the information that you needed. There's no way it could be used to find out anybody's secrets. Um, our system isn't used for any military applications like the 18th Space Control Squadron is. And that's, a, and I'm, by the way, I'm ex Air Force. I don't want everybody knowing everything about what their radar systems do because that is part of our military. But for our systems, it's okay. So we could share that, we could pass that along. And so I don't know how they're gonna end up working it out. Mm -hmm. uh, again, NASA might be a really great go between. I'll, I'll, I'll volunteer Heather to do that, right? Sorry, Heather. Um, you know, get the NASA people do it, but something that's not. Maybe it's the military thing that made them not want to go to the 18th Space Control Squadron, um, spacetrot.org, and actually be able to have a chance to share that information. I don't know. I don't know. Fantastic. Well, I, I think we're coming to the end of the um, hour. Uh, Darren, I want to thank you uh, for all this, uh, the work that you are doing with Leo Labs and for this great presentation. You gave us a lot to think about. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending today. I just want to also thank our uh, sponsor, Solar Credit uh, Union, for uh, helping us uh, with our events at SPARC. And I want to announce uh, very quickly that our next UW Space Dialogue is February 3rd. This is with Greg Miller. He is Professor of Military and Security Studies at the Air Command and Staff College, and he will be talking about deterrence by debris. Uh, the downside uh, to uh, cleaning up uh, space. On February 8th, uh, we have initiated the Institute for Space Law and Data and Policy, and there we will be looking at the problem of orbital uh, debris as well from a legal and policy perspective. Thank you so much again for joining us. And Darren, let me give you the last word. I think you have your hand up. So if you would like to say uh, something, that would be great. So I just want to thank the University of Washington and Amy and Sadia because you know something? I've done an a, a, a absolutely horrible number of these things over the last two years. And I don't think I've seen such a high quality group of people. I just put to the second page of people on earth, such a high quality people. So I just appreciate y'all taking your time and suffering through yet another Zoom call after we've had two years of Zooms. Thank you for your time. And, and most of you know how to find me, send me an email and we can chat more. But thank you for the opportunity um, and, and uh, happy new year. Happy New Year, Darren, and thank you, and we'll have you back again for other events. Thank you so much for today, and thank you all, everybody, for uh, coming. Bye-bye.